Merry Christmas, friends. Merry Christmas. How y'all doing? Good. You're ready to see what God has planned as we go in search of a perfect Christmas. Would you just look at your neighbor and say, I am so glad that you are here. I am so glad that each of you are here because we all know that this time of time of year that there are many things that we could be doing. So thank you for carving out the time so that we can celebrate together and go on search. I mean, is a perfect peace-filled Christmas even possible anymore? To get us starting to think about the Christmas season, I thought, what if we took a stroll down Christmas memory lane and in your life, is there a perfect present that you have received over the years? You know, maybe that favorite gift that was left under the Christmas tree labeled just for you. Anybody have any ideas coming to mind? For me, it brings back when I was a little girl about six years old. There was one thing that I thought I absolutely positively must have. You want to know what it was? The Barbie Townhouse. Anybody remember that? The three-story Barbie Townhouse Deluxe Edition complete with the elevator. Anyone? I see some nods out there. You know, I wanted one bad. So I wrote a letter to Santa. I hand delivered it to the big jolly guy myself, and I felt confident that I was going to get the gift that I wanted. But Santa came to my house, and there was no Barbie townhouse left under the Christmas tree for me, only a watch. So then I thought, I know. I bet Santa told my grandma and grandpa about the Barbie townhouse. You can always count on grandmas and grandpas, right? That must be it. So I went to my grandmas and grandpas, and I looked underneath their beautifully decorated Christmas tree, but there was no box big enough with my name on it. Now, there was one box that was pretty big. It was pr pretty colorful, but it had a tag on it that said, For Bruce, my grandpa. So at the end of the night, you know, all my favorite relatives are gathered around, and we go through all of the presents, and then the only present left is the big one for Bruce. So my grandpa says, hey, Cindy, can you go over there and open that big present for me? And I remember thinking, oh, sure, Grandpa. And I kind of shuffled over to the big box. And as I began to pull back the paper, all of a sudden I could see patches of hot pink and sky blue and orange. And then all of a sudden I thought, oh, could it be the Barbie Townhouse Deluxe Edition? Do you see that elevator just for me? I asked my mom, that sweater came from Sears and Roebuck, if anybody wants to pop, pick up a little vest like that. That's classic. Wouldn't it be nice if all of our Christmas stories ended that way, right? With the smiles and the surprises and our favorite relatives. And of course, perfect hand-picked presents just for us. No re-gifting necessary. And wouldn't it be wonderful if our house, whether it's large or small, always looked like it was right out of, I don't know, like Better Homes and Garden Magazine? I love the December issue because they have sparkling ideas for your holidays this month. And if all of our meals looked like the cheesecake from Southern Living, this is a red velvet, red velvet white chocolate cheesecake, if anybody's interested in that. And I was checking out Good Housekeeping. They said that you can have gifts that they'll love starting at 99 cents for your friends, for your family, for everyone. No more stressful shopping this season. We can just go right to this good housekeeping idea. And of course, it wouldn't be Christmas without all of Oprah's favorite things. You know what Oprah's favorite things are this month? Cheese, chocolate, and eggnog martinis. I said, hmm. <laughs> but of course, looking through these magazines, we always want to keep it real simple. I think there's a lot of women out there that are hoping for a picture-perfect Christmas this season. And really, these days, we don't even need magazines anymore, do we? With Pinterest magazines, we don't even have to pick them up. How many of you use Pinterest? I promise you I won't tell you it's bad. 
So, okay, fair amount, fair amount. I use it too, although I'll be very honest, I pin things, but I never do that. I keep looking at my mom because she's pinning some good recipes, so I can't keep waiting for her to invite me over. But so far, I haven't tried anything on there, although it looks really good. But there are a lot of women pinning things right now. I checked, you know, Pinterest started in July of 2010. In case you're thinking, Pinterest, I don't know what this is. It's kind of like an online pin board. So instead of ripping things out of magazines like we did in the old days, you just pin things and then you pin them on your online website. So kind of like ripping out the magazines with your favorite pictures and articles and recipes. In July 2010 is when Pinterest started. As of July of 2013, 70 million users, it says Pinterest has. 70 million. And you know how many are women? 80%. 80%, the statistics said. Friends, that's a lot of women hoping that their Christmas is Pinterest perfect this year. And my sense is, is whether we're pulling things out of magazine, planning, pinning, however we're getting ready for the holidays, I sense we're probably not counting on the weird relatives, the family feuds, maxed out credit cards, late night gift wrapping frazzled sessions where we're trying to get everything wrapped or just thrown in a bag, and absolutely no empty chairs where our loved ones should be. I wonder if anyone would like to experience a peace-filled Christmas this holiday season. I know that I would. And unfortunately, I feel like as an adult, my Christmases have looked less than picture perfect and a little bit more like Charlie Brown's. And did anybody watch Charlie Brown again when it was on Monday night here in Grand Rapids? You remember the classic Charlie Brown, right? You know, poor Charlie Brown just can't catch a break no matter what he does. His friends seem to have forgotten the true meaning of Christmas. Nobody wants to send him a Christmas card this year. And then he puts up a Christmas tree, and what do his friends do? They tease him about that, too. At one point, Charlie Brown says to Lucy these words. Charlie Brown says, My trouble is Christmas. I just don't understand it. Instead of feeling happy, I feel sort of let down. And I wonder if anyone here tonight would say the same thing. You know, Cindy, my problem is Christmas. I just don't understand it. Instead of feeling happy like everyone else in their sparkly stuff, I feel sort of let down. I feel let down by my friends too. Or I feel let down by these test results because they did not come back as I had hoped. I feel let down with these relationship challenges, Cindy, and I can't go through the holidays pretending like everything is okay. Maybe you say, I feel let down because I'm all alone. Friends, whether you identify with the magazines or with Charlie Brown, I am truly so glad that you are here tonight. Because together, let's explore how do we make it through the holiday season with all of the picture-perfect ideals? How do we make it through without giving in to disappointment, discouragement, unrealistic expectations, or kind of just a toxic combination of them all? I mean, am I the only one, but you feel good, and then you see on Facebook everybody has all of their Christmas decorations up already, and you think, I still have pumpkins on my porch. Maybe somebody will come take those down tomorrow for us. <laughs> How do we experience peace in the midst of the holiday preparations? I had some friends w coming in. Cindy, I'm glad to be here because we're feeling stressed out. We're, hope we're hoping that you're going to help us. I'm hoping you're going to help me too. <laughs> Is it even possible to experience a peace-filled Christmas in the year 2013? Well, thankfully, friends, God has not left us guessing about what to do. And tonight, we're not going to be looking on Pinterest, magazines, websites, but instead, God's powerful word. I'd like to open up the word, look at the original Christmas story to see what we can learn from the very first Christmas. And I'd also like to share three very important insights with you. Now, if you're the note-taking type, you might want to jot these three insights down. So this would be a good time to grab a pen or an old receipt or something to write on the back. But how do we experience a perfect peace-filled Christmas. 
So I'd like to read to you from Luke 2, the Christmas story. If you have a copy of the scriptures and you want to follow along, it's Luke 2, 4 through 14. Luke is in the New Testament of the Bible. So you have Matthew, Mark, and then Luke. Luke 2, 4 through 14. And if you just want to sit back and relax and let me read this to you, I would be so pleased to do that as well. Luke 2, the original Christmas story. It says, So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. So right here we have Joseph and Mary. They are pledged to be married. Mary is pregnant, but not with Joseph's baby. And everybody said, hmm. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she, Mary, she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Can you say, no room? No room. This is all play. We'll try that again. Can you say, no room? And there were shepherds living in the, out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Of course they were. I would be too, right? But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy. That will be for all the people. For all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, can we read this aloud together? We'll have it on the screen. Glory. On earth peace. So how many of you have heard this passage before? You know, maybe you've even memorized it as a young child. I wonder when you hear this, does an image come to mind, like a beautiful, wonderful, delightful image like this come to mind? <laughs> but as we read the original Christmas story, this is far from what really took place in the scripture. In fact, the first Christmas, it was dirty. It was dirty. There were no sparkly decorations. They didn't stay at the JW, Joseph and Mary. They didn't have a beautiful decorated house. They didn't even have a room. Most scholars agree that they were placed in the back with animals in more like a dark shepherd's cave. So not like the fresh straw pictures that we see, but a dirty, dark shepherd's cave. The first Christmas was dirty. The first Christmas, it was smelly. No great scents, no Yankee Candle Christmas Eve scent going on here. The scents from the first Christmas were the animals in the cave in years of their, uh, how do you say, it? like their droppings. That was the smell of the first Christmas. The first Christmas was stinky. The first Christmas was painful. I mean, let's think about Mary as a young mother, young woman giving birth to her first child. No childbirth class, like nobody there to say, push, Mary, push. No sanitary conditions, epidural, no way. The first Christmas was painful. The first Christmas, it was lonely. Mary and Joseph, they were away from home they were alone. They were away from their family in a strange city. The first Christmas, it was dirty. It was stinky. It was painful. It was lonely. And my sense is it was a bit disappointing too. I mean, think about Joseph. Here he is with Mary. This is not how he pictured life turning out. Can you imagine with Mary at this time of great need? I wonder if Joseph was disappointed or was he frustrated because he wanted to help Mary. But how could he in the in this dark cave with the animals? The first Christmas was disappointing. I think if we sum it all up, we could just say that the first Christmas was messy. 
Is that fair? The first Christmas was messy. And somehow when I read this in the Bible, something in me, in me wants to say, God, this is not what Christmas is supposed to look like. It's supposed to be pretty and joyful and colorful and sparkly. Lord, this is not what Christmas is supposed to look like. Have you ever said that? Like, God, this is not what Christmas is supposed to look like. My husband was not supposed to get the pink slip two weeks before Christmas. This is not what Christmas is supposed to look like. Or maybe you find out that all of your grown children are going to the in-laws this year, and it's going to be you home alone all, all by yourself, you know? God, this is not what Christmas is supposed to look like. The Hallmark movies, they don't look like this. Sometimes Christmas does not look like we think that it should. Christmas can be messy, can it? Andrea touched a little bit about my story, and I think it's important for you to know I might be wearing a little sparkle tonight, but I have said those are very exact same words. God, this is not what Christmas is supposed to look like. Is it okay if I kind of get personal for a second? I mean, I know this is a nice candlelight, but I just want to be real. Can we be real here? Would you look at your neighbor and say, can we be real here tonight? <laughs> you know, I won't, I won't go into my whole story, but I think you should know that my childhood, although I had a wonderful mom, she's here tonight, great parents, all the Barbies a little girl could ever want, I had some difficulties, and it left me feeling pretty alone and empty. And so I tried to fill that emptiness, that loneliness in my heart. You name it, I tried it. Food, men, alcohol, shopping, even drugs. Nothing worked. I think my theme song back then could have been looking for love in all the wrong places. It was empty, self-defeated living. My bottom came in 1996, when as a single mom to an adorable little guy named Jake, he had the curliest red hair, he was about two years old, and his mom overdosed, yeah, that's me, overdosed on cocaine, and nearly lost my life to the addiction. Thankfully, a woman came to me in the midst of my mess, and she told me about a new and a better way to live in the midst of this just crazy chaotic time, she said to me four very simple but life-changing words. She said to me, Cindy, you need Jesus. I wish I could tell you that it was some big hallelujah moment and the skies parted and I saw the glory of the Lord shine too. But basically I stood there in my kitchen and said, dear God, I've made a mess of my life. I don't know what this means. I, all I know is that I have tried everything, and if there's something out there that could fill this emptiness, I probably would have found it by now. So Jake needs a better mom than this, so I'll give this Jesus thing a try. So I started to read the Bible, and I began to put into practice what it was saying. And suddenly, I was experiencing a hope and an unconditional, unfailing love like never before. It's like the empty places of my heart were suddenly filled with this peace and this joy. I started working with homeless teen moms at the Salvation Army and their kids, and I loved it. Started going to church all the time, started being fully present with my son, and then I met a guy. And not just any guy, but like a really kind, Jesus-loving guy that respected me, like, whole new thing, like, wow, and his name was David Timmer, and we met while I was working, our first date was at church, after a friendship of two years, David asked me to marry him, and I said, absolutely yes, I felt like I was living one of those Hallmark commercials, my son Jake was so happy, David was happy, I was happy, we were planning this wedding. I was never gonna have to be a single mom again. I think you can sum up that time best by how the Duck Dynasty gang says, we were happy, happy, happy. And that's a fact, Jack. Life was good. 
and with one phone call, everything changed. On December 10, 1998, I received a call while I was at my parents' home that David had been killed in a freak workplace accident. That night is a blur. I can remember weeping, wailing, throwing myself on my parents' hardwood floor, pounding my fists in the ground. My parents' home quickly filled with neighbors, grief counselors, friends, pastor, everyone wanting to help, everyone wanting to say something, but nobody having the right words to say, because what, what do you say? There are no words. I remember one point, my mom has a few stairs in her home, much like this, and at one point, the, you know, the Christmas tree is in the background, and I cleared everyone out of the room, everyone. People trying to take my blood pressure, like, out! Everybody out, except my pastor. And I sat him on the steps, and I said, you tell me why. Why? Why would God allow this? David was such a wonderful guy. He used to say that he would give his life for one person to know Christ. Why would God take him home? And right before Christmas, God, this is not what Christmas is supposed to look like. This is not the Christmas that I signed up for. But here's what I know to be true, friends. Here is what I know to be true. God is with us in the mess. God is with us in the mess. Would you say that with me? God is I mean, if you, we go back to the first Christmas story, it was messy, right? It was dirty. It was stinky. It was painful. It was lonely, and it was disappointing. But Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, which literally means God with us, Jesus was born in the mess, not in the fancy place, not where it was all sparkly, but Jesus was born in the mess. I mean, can you even believe it? If anyone had a right to demand that everything be picture perfect on that day, it would be God. Why did God allow for Jesus to become, come in the mess? We don't know for sure. You know, scholars have all their theories. We don't know. But I wonder, I wonder if our God, our compassionate, holy, loving God, decided to allow his perfect son to come so that we would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that he is with us. Not just when we have it all put together, because I, I would never be with him then. I never have it all put together, do you? Like, who, who has it all put together all the time? God sent Jesus to come in the mess, and I wonder if it's so that we would always know that he is with us. God is with us in the mess. You know, bottom line, God gave us Jesus in his way and on his terms. And if as we read this, it seemed less than picture perfect, actually it really wasn't. It was perfectly divine. It was perfectly divine. God is with us in the mess. You know, your Christmas might be messy this year. I'm guessing there's some messy parts to it because we live in a broken, fallen world. So most of us will experience some kind of messiness this Christmas. But may I remind you and may I promise you based on the authority of God's word that God is with you in the mess. He's with you in the mess. A verse that I clung to during that very painful first Christmas after David's accident. Couldn't even believe it. Christmas came two weeks after my fiance's funeral. Two weeks. I see my friend Karen here tonight that actually helped dress me for the funeral, helped get me out the door. And two weeks later is Christmas. My mom, bless her heart, would say, you know, Cindy, what do you want to do? What should we do? Do you and Jake want to come over here? I don't know. Should we go to your grandma's in Indiana? I don't know. What do you want? I don't know. Everything is wrong, Mom. Everything. Like, how can we go to Myers and people are just shopping like everything is okay? It's not okay. 
My Christmas is messy. It's not okay. Finally, on Christmas Eve, I said, Mom, I think I know what we're supposed to do. The teen mom from the Salvation Army, they invited us to the shelter for dinner, and we went. And that night, they made us ribs, chitlins, greens, cornbread, all their favorite foods, anything else they could find in the fridge. <laughs> they made it for us that night. We didn't have fancy plates, mismatched paper plates, no punch bowl, no tablecloth, no Pinterest crafts. I don't know what I wore. I'm guessing it wasn't sparkly. But God was with us in the mess. A verse that I really clung to was Psalm 34, 18. Listen to how the message paraphrases it. The message Bible says, if your heart is broken, you'll find God right there. Where? Right there. If your heart is broken, you'll find God right there. I experienced God that first Christmas at the Teen Living Center of the Salvation Army as those teens served me served my family they were jesus with skin on and if it seemed like to the magazines it was anything less than perfect it was not it was perfectly divine god is with us in the mess can you tell me insight number one please god is with us in the mess so whether you're here tonight and maybe you've got some messy parts, or maybe this year, you, you know, you could be from Better Homes and Garden Magazine. I think all of us, wherever we are on the spectrum, I all think peace, we, I think we all would agree peace would be good this Christmas. Anybody want some peace? My kids keep saying, Mom, what do you want for Christmas? Peace on Earth. They're like, well, what else? Peace on Earth. Wouldn't that be nice? A little peace on Earth. But where do we find peace in this crazy world that we live in? I don't know about you, but my list of stuff to do this month is about this long. Is peace even possible? Well, there's a little vase illustration that maybe would help us talk about where can we find peace this holiday season? Maybe you've seen something like this before, but we're going to have these three different vases represent three different ways that we can look at Christmas this holiday season. So this first vase, this is going to represent kind of like the world's way of living. Okay, so vase number one, the world's way. Will you say the world's way? So if we listen to the magazines, if we spend a lot of time online, the world tells us things like, if we're going to have peace, then we just need lots of money. If you have lots of money, then that will bring you peace. Or if you could just fit into your skinny jeans, this holiday season, life is good. You've got your skinny jeans, nothing else you need. Skinny jeans, all you need. Or the world tells us, I'm sorry, Ken is a little bit inappropriate here. <laughs> Sorry about that. Ken, what you doing? Um, the world says, sorry, all of them like this. The world says, if you have a man, life is good. Some of you are here tonight saying, no, I'm thinking if I had a different man, but we won't go there. The world says, if you have a man, everything is good. Or maybe you think, if I could just catch up on my emails, if I could just see an empty inbox for once, life would be good, then I would have peace. Or things where if I just had a little bit more control, everything's out of my control. But if somehow I could just figure out how to have control again, then life would be good. And I think around the holiday season, these messages just kind of intensify. Like, as soon as I get the holiday shopping done, then I'll be fine. I mean, how many people say, if I'm just going to go after Thanksgiving, I'm going to get it all done, and then I can take the rest of the month off. Really? How's that working for us? Not so well. Or when the house is decorated, when the tree is perfect, then I will have peace. So this first base represents kind of the world's way of living. Like when this happens, then I will have peace. Can I tell you a secret? When, then, thinking never leads to peace. Never. Never. There's never enough. I know, because you know why? This was my life for 26 years. When I lose the weight, then I'll be fine. If I could just use a little more drugs, then I could lose more weight. If I just had more alcohol, then people would like me. If I just had a different job, it never works. Nothing can satisfy this. And there is nothing worse than being full and still being empty. 
base number one. This will be the world's way. And I think we'll sum it up. No God equals no peace. Would you say that with me? So base number two, we're going to have this represent God's way of living. So this is going to be a woman who knows that her peace comes from following Jesus. Because when we invite Jesus into our life as our personal Savior, God's Holy Spirit, it takes residence inside of us. And through the filling of the Holy Spirit, God desires to permeate every inch of our life and fill up every empty, hollow place. In fact, one part of the Bible, Jesus describes himself as living water. Living water. Now, a woman like this, does this mean that life will never get messy? Mm -mm. Does this mean that things will always be perfect? Absolutely not. But a woman that's filled up with Jesus Christ, does this mean that she can experience peace whatever holiday madness comes her way? I believe absolutely yes. Jesus alone can satisfy every single part of her life. So no matter what comes, she can experience peace. Maybe not happiness, but she can experience peace. This is a woman who has found that things or people on the outside will not fill her up. Peace comes from the inside.